There's a very small Trappist monastery in the vast pine forest that surrounds Monk's Corner, about 70 miles outside of Charleston, South Carolina. I visited my friend, the former guest master of the Gethsemane Monastery, where I used to spend a lot of time in Kentucky, Brother Luke, when he was assigned to uh, go down to Mepkin Abbey uh, to be their music director for a couple of years. While visiting, Luke took me out to the edge of the monastery to show me their egg producing business that the brothers operated to support themselves. More than 10,000 hens occupied the rows and rows of cages of what the brothers called their lay sisters, <laughs> who, <laughs> they, that's, and that's Trappist humor, ladies and gentlemen, that's as, that's as good as it gets at the monastery. But the lay sisters tirelessly worked to support the monastery, but every few months, I don't know how long a, a hen's laying life is, but every few months they have to replace them all. And so a large truck from Campbell's Soup rambles up onto the property and they open all the cages and the monks chase scrambling chickens all over their acreage in what they call a chicken party. But as Luke observed, it really wasn't much of a party for the chickens because they would soon be a part of a can of Campbell's chicken noodle soup. The image reminded me of an old 80s song that made fun of the elections. It says, I was born down south on a chicken farm near Nashville, Tennessee. Tweren't nobody there except a sky full of air and 17, 17 million chickens and me. And then one day, I said to myself, I think I'll try a little bit of that LSD. Well, it blew my mind, and I got real kind, and I set my chickens free. <laughs> there was chickens in the pasture and chickens in the barn. There was chickens driving Cadillacs to Washington, D.C. when I set my chickens free. In this presidential election year, we have two parties going by different names, vying to gain control of the American government. Each party tries to make their convention look as festive as possible, but I assure you, just like the chicken parties at Mepkin Abbey, there's always victims, always victims. Because of my stridently liberal uh, newspaper opinion column, most Republicans in Springfield assume that I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat. What they may be surprised to know is that the only correspondence I've received from the Greene County Democratic Association for the past several years has been extremely hostile. Even though I'm the only published member of clergy in local media, you'll notice that I'm never asked to speak at any of the Democratic gatherings because they don't trust me. <laughs> I've, I've been far too critical of uh, elected Democrats. They either want me to be a devout, unquestioning Democrat, or they don't want me at all. Religious professionals are not supposed to promote one party or one candidate over another, and though I'm not often known for bowing to such rules, that one comes pretty easily to me. I see victims in both parties, and it's easier for me to say a pox on both of your camps than it is for me to applaud either one. My spirituality informs my politics as much as I am capable of making that true, and I hope that yours does as well. But a sincere spirituality doesn't fit well into any political party. As a spiritual person, the guiding principle that I bring to governance is a preference for policies that provide the greatest good for the largest number of people. It's not simple utilitarianism but a rather radical compassion that dictates that, that spiritual desire to see the greatest good provided to the largest number of people. Therefore, I favor a more equitable distribution of wealth rather than stacking the deck so that a minority gets to hold the majority of the resources. Because my spirituality directs me to pursue the greatest good for the largest number of people, I oppose the exploitation of the poor the oppression of minorities, unjust wars, unequal justice in the court system, and the despoiling of the environment. Granted then, at least based on rhetoric alone, I'm much more often likely to favor a Democrat over a Republican, 
but we should resist all temptations to baptize either party. Rhetoric sounds good. Judging by actions, there's not enough difference to get excited. Charles Toy, the founder of the website called The Christian Left, summed up his opposition to Mitt, the Mitt Romney candidacy, candidacy this way. He posted uh, on The Christian Left, Mitt Romney's platform is this, deny gay people the right to marry, deny women the right to make decisions about their own body, deny health care to millions of Americans, restart the Cold War, return to Bush-era torture policies, instate austerity, privatize Medicare and Social Security, make it harder for kids to get a college education, destroy the unions, roll back regulations on Wall Street, start more wars in the Middle East, raise taxes on the poor and the middle class, cut taxes for the rich, and double down on the failed drug war. Any questions? I recognize that Charles can back each of those claims up, if not with a direct recent quote from Mitt Romney, at least from the lips of other nationally prominent Republicans. And I don't want to play a yes but game or engage in false equivalencies because all of those issues that Charles Toy named are very real and they're very serious. But it does have to also be said that President Obama doubled down on a war in Afghanistan, and I've yet to hear him or anyone in his administration defend the claim that we have any militarily achievable goal in that nation that in any way justifies the expenditure or the loss of life. I know some of you disagree, but this practice of political assassination by predator drones is to me an outrage. We use these sci-fi style flying robots to kill people that a generation ago we said it was illegal because it was political assassination. Now we call it a military target. And though these drones are extremely accurate and very lethal, they don't kill with a single bullet. The collateral casualty numbers of victims who just happen to be at the kill zone at the time the drone is there has become so large that the Obama administration changed the way they defined citizen casualties and called now anyone of military fighting age that dies in a blast as a military target, which in these countries that we're talking about would include just about everyone that wasn't an infant or a disabled elderly person. So most of you are potential terrorists if you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, many people have accepted even targeting of American citizens who've not been tried, not even been indicted for any crime, but just assassinated. And you accept it because you trust the judgment of President Obama, but a precedent has been set that surely even those of you who trust President Obama with this kind of authority to kill alleged enemies of the state at will, surely even you can think of some recent president that you would like to not have that authority. And we have to realize that now that a precedent has been set, future presidents that you might not like at all don't have to ask anybody before they kill American citizens at will. We still have Getmo. We use secret foreign prisons where prisoners are certainly being tortured. We still have an obscene judicial system in which the wealthy almost always get their way. And I want to digress here for just a moment. I think uh, if Bill Clinton can speak for 48 minutes in a 15-minute slot, you guys are going to have to cut me a little slack now and then. Especially all of you who joined me working so hard gathering signatures to put an initiative to raise the minimum wage in Missouri and to, to cap the interest rates charged to the poor by payday loan businesses. We went all over the city knocking on doors, gathering signatures, and we got more than enough signatures to get the initiatives on the ballot. But even though we made it way past the number necessary, the Chamber of Commerce in Missouri joined forces with the attorneys for the payday loan industry, and they kept making challenges against some of the petitions, particularly in St. Louis. And we defended them and defended them and demonstrated that we had more than enough signatures, but they just kept making challenges until we literally ran out of money. It's not that we didn't have enough signatures, it's that we didn't have enough money when they were manipulating the judicial system. And this, men and women, is classic. 
As Howard Zinn said, our judicial system does not exist to determine who is right and who is wrong. It simply determines who can afford to pay their lawyer the longest. The just cause of the poor in the state of Missouri has once again been defeated by the profit motive of the payday loan industry. Echoing our reading from James this morning, a reading which, by the way, would not receive a friendly hearing in churches if it weren't straight out of the Bible. I think David was right in wanting to sidestep, don't be mad at me, this was Jesus' brother who wrote this. But he says in chapter uh, 2, verse 6, Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? In this country, we ostensibly were to have a, a blind justice system that delivered equal justice. But i got to tell you, we don't even come close to that. Politicians are under constraint always to be politically correct. They will word things in a way to make it as acceptable to the largest number of people as possible. But prophets are under a constraint to tell the truth, to just be correct, to tell the truth and to let the chips fall where they will. James writes about uh, an applied spirituality that is nakedly honest, and it is nearly entirely dismissive of almost everything that we know of that passes for Christianity in the 21st century. He says plainly that faith without works is as good as dead. It's a farce. It's a joke. It's pretend religion. If you're not actively working to provide the greatest good to the largest number of people, then you really have no business calling yourself a Christian. And this comes from the brother of Jesus. Faith is a way of life. It's not a way of believing. It's how we live and what we do and how we create justice and mercy and compassion. Otherwise, it's just talk. Few people in America were more emotionally moved by the election of President Obama than I was in, in 2008. But honestly, he was not my first choice. Honestly, he was not my second choice. I didn't think he was ready. I didn't think he had enough experience to be president. But once elected, the fact that a black man who once ate from a table financed by food stamps, who rose above all the, the hurdles in front of him to become a Harvard-educated attorney and then the president of the United States, that's nothing short of miraculous. And I don't want to diminish the significance of that marvelous historical event, but I also will not ignore the fact that this wonderful man reappointed all of the uh, financial monetary controls that put us into bankruptcy in 2007, and that he has appointed the owners and designers of Franken Foods in charge of our food supply. Earlier this summer, I attended the Wild Goose Festival in North Carolina, and I was, I was very pleased to get to hear Frank Schaefer, the son of the famous evangelical preacher and author Francis Schaefer. Uh, Frank Schaefer was, at one time, following in his father's footsteps. He was flying all over the country in the private jets of televangelists, writing for them, producing films, and speaking at their conferences. But Frank had a kind of epiphany, and he was able to walk away from all that money and all that hypocrisy. I was glad to hear someone who could firsthand speak to the falsehood and the manipulation and the exploitation of the gullible in order to get their money and to tell them how to vote. And I was glad that he had the character to walk away from all that. But Frank chided the liberals in his audience who had been, in his opinion, far too critical of President Obama. He didn't say it the way Chris Rock recently boiled it down, but it was something like the way that Chris Rock said that voting uh, for someone other than President Obama because President Obama has disappointed you is like saying, Obama didn't cure cancer, so next election I'm going to vote for cancer. That, that was sort of his attitude. But as I heard Frank Schaefer speak during the week of the festival, he told us about how he had gotten disgusted with religion, he quit believing anything, and had stopped going to church, but that when he had grandchildren, he began to reconsider, and to seek out a way to have a spiritual life that had integrity for him. He told us that he now attends an Orthodox church because he loves the liturgy, he loves the, the sacraments and the whole non-rational, otherworldly mysticism of the service. 
But when he was asked about the Orthodox Church's refusal to allow women in leadership and their official condemnation of homosexuality, he shrugged his shoulders and said, I guess you have to make some compromises. It's easy enough to make that compromise, I guess, if you happen to be a heterosexual male. But if you're a female or if you're gay, what gives Frank Schaefer the right to dismiss someone else's integrity as a human being as a compromise? I don't think you get to make that compromise. I don't think you get to make that choice for someone else, especially in the name of going to church. Now, at the ballot box, I'm going to fight for my right to vote my conscience, but there are going to be lots of times that I simply have to vote for the lesser of two evils. But I'm not even going to pretend that I have shifted my spiritual loyalty to a political party. And I will not give loyalty to a church that intentionally, constitutionally, discriminates against their own people for reasons of their gender or their race or their sexual orientation. Now, I hate to be prescriptive, but come on, folks. And, and especially those of you who join us via YouTube and iTunes, if you're a woman, why would you go to a church that tells you because you don't have male parts that you cannot serve in any capacity that men can serve in? And if you're gay, why would you attend a church that's willing to cash the checks you put in the offering plate but won't allow you to speak from the pulpit or let you be photographed in the church's pictorial directory with your partner? You should just stop it. Don't buy bullets for your own assassin. Don't support the people who oppress you. Demand the greatest good for the most people. And you're not going to get to the greatest good for the most people by oppressing more than half the population that's female and a tenth of the population that's gay. Now, I'm not going to try to speak for you, but assuming that you at least at some level agree with my notion that we should work for the greatest good for the most people in politics, even there there's room for debate. There is an argument that can be made that Ill-conceived public assistance can rob a person of motivation to work and be self-supporting. And I think there's room then for a Republican Party and a Democratic Party that intelligently speaks to how do we give care to the most vulnerable members of society. We're not doing ourselves any favor if religious people are always just saying that we should hand out food and housing and medical care without any motivation to work. There's a, there's a debate to be had here. There's a conversation to be had here if we can first agree that both Republicans and Democrats want to work for the greatest good for the largest number of people. Affordable electricity is a huge issue to the poor. We get phone calls here every day from people asking for help with their utility bill. We want to keep electricity prices down. However, the cheapest electricity generated in the United States is generated by burning coal. So, and by the way, no matter how many times advertisements put the words clean and coal together, <laughs> yeah, if you don't believe in unicorns or flying dragons that breathe fire, there's no such thing as clean coal. So if burning coal is the cheapest electricity we get, but it pollutes the uh, environment and leading to long-term destruction, is that really the greatest good for the most people? There's a debate to be had there. Some people argue that we need to pass right-to-work laws so that there can be more jobs in our state, and there would be. But is the creation of jobs that pay less than what it costs to live a good idea in the long run? You can get an immediate bump of something positive and a long-term punishment. A present benefit in exchange for creating an abusive permanent economy, in my opinion, doesn't turn out to be the greatest good for the most people. As Elizabeth Warren noted in her recent speech in North Carolina, if you feel like the system is stacked against you, that's because the system is stacked against you. <laughs> what we need to do is change the system. Setting the chickens free seems like liberation in the moment, but if you're just going to be putting them into a can of soup by Wednesday, then we're not really talking about liberation, are we? 
So why would we vote for a system that opens your cage with one hand while it shoves you in a soup can with the other? The portrait of Dorothy Day that hangs in our conference room has a caption that quotes Dorothy, the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, who says, our problems stem from our acceptance of this filthy, rotten system. My modest suggestion is that you not act or vote like you accept a filthy, rotten system. I suggest that you get real kind and set your chickens free. You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.